Hello everyone, here's hoping you're all doing well and staying healthy wherever you are. My name is Alejandra Almada and on behalf of my friends Giselle Valdez, Marian Bolnes, Laura Santos and Barbara Silvera, I am pleased to welcome you to our presentation. Thank you for taking the time today to join us. It should go without saying that Gloria Naylor and Toni Morrison are critically acclaimed African-American female writers. I'll bet many of you recognize one or both of their names. Both of them rose above difficulty from an underprivileged background and majored in English at school. Both were professors at distinguished universities. Both have been recognized with awards, from Naylor's American Book Award for her first novel, The Women of Brewster Place and Guggenheim Fellowship, to Morrison's Presidential Medal of Freedom in addition to a Nobel and Pulitzer Prize. Surely their credentials are more than crystal clear. It's evident from this perspective why we should be interested in their voices, what it is that they might have to contribute to society through their novels, and what others have determined they've done. Today, however, we'd like to point your attention in a different direction, and suggest that perhaps the most important thing that these women did was write. Both wrote an abundance of novels, a plethora of stories. They wrote them with their heart for their audience. To talk to women like themselves about self-worth, for example, or to pass on to others the same love of folklore that their parents gave them. That alone should make them worth listening to. The message in their writings, their perspective on how the world was then, the conflicts they portray, the issues, we're sure you'll agree they are eerily similar to what we see and hear and face even now. The Black Lives Matter movement proves that. And today, those messages are enough. Enough of a reason to listen. Our presentation is structured like a panel discussion and will focus on an in-depth dive into different themes and subjects of interest featured in five select Toni Morrison novels. These individual yet connected discussions will be conducted by analyzing each text through critical literary theories and comparing or contrasting them with Gloria Naylor's novel, Mama Day. Each one of us will speak on a different Morrison book and use diverse critical literary theories for our analysis. Starting us off is Giselle Valdez. She will be speaking on Morrison's novel, Beloved, and discussing it through a post-colonial lens. After her, Marian Bulnes will delve into Morrison's paradise using critical race and feminist theory. I shall return to present Morrison's jazz through a psychological and feminist theory lens. Then Laura Santos will explore Morrison's The Song of Solomon through critical race theory. And finally, Barbara Silvera will conclude our presentation by discussing Morrison's first novel, The Bluest Eye, from a critical race theory lens. We hope that you'll enjoy it. And without further ado, here's Giselle. Hello, my name is Giselle Valdez. I wanted to let my audience know my intake on some of the books I've read for this class. The ones I will be discussing today consist of Mama Day by Gloria Naylor and Beloved by Tani Morrison. My analysis of Beloved goes back to slavery and the physical and mental damage that resided in these oppressed individuals. In the book, we feel empathy towards Steve and Paul because even after running away, the ghosts and mistreatment from Sweet Home Plantation followed them as well, preventing them from loving freely. Also, we find the importance of motherhood. Steve was willing to kill her own children to free them from the grasps of slavery. This act of killing her daughter, beloved, transformed her life into an eternal river of guiltiness that consumed her. A pivotal asset of the book relies on memory, since the ghost of Beloved haunts the house and focuses on awakening the other characters' darkest fears, not allowing them to thrive in happiness. Despite hardships, fears, and scars, the community solves the misfortune together, leaving the name Beloved erased from their minds. When Mama Day and Beloved collide, we immediately feel the presence of magic realism. Gloria Naylor employs these techniques to provide voice to the silences and gaps in history, relying on a post-colonial sentiment. The presence of magic, mythical beliefs, and rationality deconstructs modern Western lifestyles and replaces them with matriarchal empowerment. This is reflected in Mama Day and her importance to the Willow Springs community due to her connection to folklore and conjure heritage. Magic realism is shown through both. Sifu's ghost child and Mama Day's ability to tap into the power of the other place to heal, but also use it as a tool to instigate fear in those that want to take advantage of such privilege. I would definitely recommend both novels. Both books never fail to surprise and maintain the level of curiosity in the reader 
at its highest. With this insight, I pass on the torch. Good luck! Hello, my name is Maren Bolness. I will be analyzing Paradise by Toni Morrison along with Mama Day by Gloria Naylor by identifying the critical race and feminism theory. Mama Day blooms between the interconnection of nature and men. Willow Springs, a coastal island that stands in the middle of Georgia and South Carolina, is the main setting. Mama Day is not directed to actual nature only, but recoils to the metaphorical spiritual and physical nature that binds humans together. Similarly, Paradise by Toni Morrison wallows around the interconnectedness of stories and people. It transcends race, class, nation, and gender to a small land called Ruby. The story centers on creating utopia where race and social class and gender aren't important. Ruby fails to be a place so-called free to speak and do as one desires. Like women from the convent just outside Ruby are condemned to die by the hands of Ruby men because of different religious principles. Like Paradise, the figure of God is present in Mamadi. It was believed by those who resided in Willow Springs that when the stars fell into the land and the Lord came to return them to the sky, he gifted the stars to the people in order to guide them. Just like Ruby had many secrets, many sorrows, and contrary to what our main character Gokwa might have believed, Willow Springs was never perfect, and those also a failed utopia. Women in both novels are extremely important, as Mama Day is the savior and grace that keeps Willow Springs away from normality's grip. Both texts bring to light the hypocrisy and irony of equality in our country, how people fail to listen and understand when equality diffuses into another form of advertisement and oppresses its population to no jobs and silent mistreats. In Mama Day, however, it is also taught about the idiosyncrasies of different nationalities, that people are not fooled by cultures and different pastels that make up a home. Finally, the biggest lesson of both texts to me was that present had potential only if one scorches the past to carry the ashes through the paths of the future. Both books finally illustrate that the United States might not become a home but a house because of the racial ideologies that our inhabitants seek. Gloria Naylor said that at home is being new and old, old rolled into one, knowing that as long as the old survives, you can keep changing without the nightmare of waking up to a total stranger. By our current circumstances and the movement of Black Lives Matter, it has been a stranger for far too long and must be fought. I hope these books bring to light our flaws and allow us to listen and change for the better, that it becomes a candle walk that guides future generations. Hello again. I'm Alejandra and I'll continue by exploring a woman's proper response to infidelity as shown in Jazz and Mama Day. Both narratives, involving a love triangle between a traditional heterosexual married couple and an additional woman, present an ideal exploration of the themes of infidelity, jealousy and masculinity, as well as of how each of them affect identity. Now Morrison's Jazz chronicles a couple's journey to having a stable, successful marriage in the aftermath of an affair. We meet Joe and Violet Trace during their time working in the fields, where their work places them as equals within society. When the pair move to the city, Joe becomes a breadwinner. This environmental switch from rural society to urban life can be pinpointed as the inception of Joe and Violet's identity crises. For the purpose of this analysis, identity crises are the root cause of dysfunctional marriages, and often occur when people are unhappy with themselves and their lives. Their identities first become unstable due to the loss of their apparent equality, reaching a climax when Violet begins sleeping with a doll as a way to cope with her misgivings about never having children. Joe feels emasculated by this development. The narrative allows for the interpretation that identity stability for a man is highly dependent on their feeling desired by, or receiving approval from, a woman they respect. During his identity crisis, Joe carries out an affair with an 18-year-old girl named Dorcas, which eventually restores Joe's identity as a man by granting him that validation. Through having conversations with Dorcas' aunt, Alice Manfred, Violet is given a way to deal with Joe's affair. Once again, the narrative allows us to interpret that the identity stability of a woman stems from having a fulfilling romantic relationship with a man. This comes from a lady's upbringing, and the common expectation that the best a woman can do is find a good husband. Therefore, it's natural to make the connection between an infidelity and its effects on a woman's identity. Cheating often robs a woman of her self-esteem by invalidating a love derived by association. Violet realizes the futility of blame and that she must either accept a man's flaws or leave him behind. Violet learns self-love rather than love derived from a man. By doing this, she reclaims control from the event and restores her identity. When both traces reach a point of identity stability by the end of the novel, their marriage is at its most functional. 
Providing our discussion with a juxtaposition is Mama Day's toxic love triangle between Ruby and her husband, Junior Lee, and Mama Day's grandniece, Coco. Ruby is known to be extremely possessive and jealous of any woman who catches her husband's wandering eye. It is evident from the way they interact and the hearsay around town that they have a difficult marriage. Of particular interest here is Ruby's response to catching her husband's act of infidelity, though it should be noted that it did not reach the heights of a full-on affair like Joe's did, and instead could be better described as an unwanted sexual advance towards Coco. Although Ruby is stated to be fully cognizant of her husband's proclivities, rather than retaliate against him for the event, Ruby decides to punish Coco by almost poisoning her to death. This choice embodies the cycle of their relationship where Junior Lee routinely resorts to committing infidelities while Ruby resorts to anger and violence to neutralize what she perceives as a threat to her property. Stuck in this self-fulfilling behavioral pattern, neither can achieve identity stability. When juxtaposed with the series of events in jazz, this situation shows us a case where the figure of the wife does not receive proper counsel in the wake of an infidelity, leading her to react improperly, which in turn dooms her to a perpetually dysfunctional marriage. A theme that repeats itself is a female companionship and support in such a conflict, as well as a persistent portrayal of marriage as an intrinsically selfless act, encouraging women in particular to trust in their men's love and character, as well as believe in their own worth. I personally find myself hoping that such advice finds its way to more women and is followed. I found it to be illuminating. Um, hello. The two works I was uh, tasked with reading, experiencing, and analyzing were The Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison and Mama Day by Gloria Naylor. Basically, Song of Solomon is based on the era previous to the civil rights movement, as it begins telling the story from 1931 when Robert Smith, an insurance agent, jumps off of Mercy Hospital. That same day, the first African-American baby is born. The child is named Macon Dead Jr. Macon Jr. is also known as Milkman for having breastfed well past infancy. And uh, basically, he grew up disconnected from the inequality other fellow African-Americans live due to their race and poverty. This even portrays the fracturing within the community that different stereotypes and oppressing thoughts place on minorities. For example, creating different classes that determine a hierarchy as if it was a caste system. The superiority and grandeur milk radiated also defaced the sense of community, an issue that was prevailing and is still nowadays on the black community in America is that just by existence is the criminalization of race basically you're su suspected of doing uh, something wrong and you're basically guilty until proven innocent sometimes even sentenced by their circumstance even back then it was way worse than compared to the lingering essence that still goes on but for example milkman's friend guitar who was a political activist the complete opposite to Milkman, talks about the lack of justice and the corrupted system that's set against them, especially in the South. Having the, the case of Emmett Till as an example. This exposes the way they mention race and how it relates to the experience of any African-American, especially the men. Toni Morrison tackles down this issue within the book by reflecting on her own experience and the life of, the, of an African-American man, which is Milkman. At the same time, Gloria Naylor exposes different ways in which also the color of their skin, even the different tones within the same race, can really change the experience of someone who is the same race. As a distressing experience of living in her own skin, Naylor reflects the divisiveness among the same race and the wish to become something they are not in order to become more appealing and less threatening by a society that systemically oppresses them and deprives them of their civil and human rights. This may also be known as internalized racism. Between both works, Mama Day and Song of Solomon, the general wish and hope for some black people is held by the physical and cultural characteristics of the oppressor and is very palatable, proving the stereotypical shame self-awareness, and present conflict of internalized racism. With the understanding and enlightenment these books provide, a better understanding of the issues that surround centuries of oppression towards the Black community in America, now there is a shining path into the embracing of their community's identity. Thank you so much, and I hope that so far you've enjoyed our presentation and gotten a glimpse into what these amazing writers truly are. I'm Barbara Silvera, and we'll continue this conversation by analyzing Mama Day and the Bluest Eyes. Both uncover the wounds of racial discrimination by exploring how the beauty and self-worth standards have been altered by the racist ideals.
Toni Morrison explores racism as a force that can destroy community within. He introduces whiteness as a spectrum. The word black is used as a gory term, term within themselves. Morrison explains the effects of racism in the beauty standards to the main character, Pecola, a young girl that grew up praising girls that were white from the banners and the magazine. She became obsessed with the idea of whiteness and blue eyes, believing that the world would finally see her differently and treat her differently. Racism that's fueled within is always fueled by outside sources, and Toni Morrison explains that it's completely altered one's identities. Similarly, Gloria Naylor demonstrates another aspect of the interpersonal effects of racism and discrimination. She exposes the insecurities that racism has brought the African American community, which results in the lack of identity. It can be seen when Cocoa is constantly using darker makeup for his skin, just because she doesn't feel comfortable with her community because she's not black enough. This is another direct example of how the beauty standards can affect someone's identity. Transformation is a word that has been fought through blood and tears its way into the African-American community. It would be a lie to say that we have seen a total transformation of the beauty standards to more inclusive labels, and more because we see injustices every day. One can only hope that by the hand of pieces like Naylor and Morrison, we can further understand the deep-rooted causes of such physical hatred and see the painful effects that it has brought to so many minorities. Once more, I think I speak on behalf of my friends when I say that we hope you found our presentation interesting and that it opened your eyes to different perspectives within these works of literature. We found that although each book varies in accolades, they all taught us valuable lessons and introduced us to important topics we might not have found on our own. We had a great time discovering Gloria Naylor and Toni Morrison's voices. We hope you have a great time rediscovering them too. Again, from us to you all, thank you so much for your time and have a great day.